offering. All right. Well, Danielle, you want to get us started here? Yes. Yeah, so welcome, everyone. Um, as Dwight said, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, it's exciting to, to continue on this um, learning journey um, with all of you. And for those that are just joining, um, welcome. And um, we hope that you stay with us as we just continue to delve into um, the different concepts that, that we're in. Today, we're actually going to dig into the education system um, and the contextual factors that impact that. Uh, myself, Dwight, and Sheila are going to um, participate in a conversation around it. Um, I'll probably leave more of the slides, but definitely want it to be more of a conversation. Um, I by no means will um, say that I'm an expert in any of this. This has just been my life's work, and so I'm very passionate about it, and I'd like to share just um, what I've learned in the journey um, and hopefully um, share a little with you guys and really um, become thought partners in, in ways in which we can really um, become more solution oriented around the problems that we face in this country. And so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I also um, had um, spoke with Hannah um, before. So if there are questions that are coming up or just points of discussion as, as we're talking, I told her to share the questions um, with us and, and I'll try to, or um, Dwight, um, and or Sheila could answer the questions and then we'll leave time at the end about 15, 20 minutes to have an open discussion and or questions around just the information um, that was shared and or some thoughts that came up. So Dwight. All right, well, I think uh, again, welcome. And uh, I, I just wanna say, first of all, Dr. Brown is an expert in this field and uh, we are very excited to have her joining us. Um, and uh, like we usually do, and, and Danielle, if you want to go to the next slide, we usually just kind of give a little introduction. I feel like most of you know who we are, um, uh, but I think it's helpful for any of the folks that are joining maybe for the first time or have uh, not been involved, at least more recently, to just give you an update. My name is Dwight Yoder. I am an attorney at Gibble Crable and Hess, um, and we started on this, what I would say, this journey it's been about two years now, I think, uh, that we started back at Bethel AME Church with a partnership to really the, uh, the goal was to look back at the history of our country and uh, understand and learn about the, uh, the, the fact that it was founded on a system of slavery and that discrimination has been a part of this country's history from its very founding. Because until you understand the history of the country, you're never going to understand what's going on now. And so part of the, um, the motivation was, let's at least start this process of looking at our history and understanding it. Because once you do that, it puts into focus what's going on now and, and many of the challenges that we face currently. So I've been practicing over 20 years. I originally grew up in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I uh, have been in Lancaster now for uh, a long time. Uh, my wife's a school teacher, Julie. Um, she's an awesome school teacher and, uh, and a loving wife. And we have three adult kids. And um, yeah, so this, uh, this has been a passion of mine to, to uh, look at these issues, think about them and find ways to hopefully make a difference. And that's a struggle that I've had, which is you know, understanding the history only gets you so far, right? It's like, what do you do with that now? And, and where do you take it from here? So that's part of what this journey is. And I'm really excited that we are kind of transitioning to what I call our topical areas. The first five seminars broke up the history of our country um, and looked at them, um, uh, you know, kind of chronologically to give an explanation of the history. And now we're going to kind of go back and look at things through a different lens, which is um, a topical lens. And we talked about voting back in October, I think it was. And so I'm excited to hear Dr. Brown talk about uh, the education. So I'll stop there and let Sheila and, and Danielle introduce themselves. Ahead, Danielle. <clears throat> uh, my name is Dr. Danielle Brown. Um, I am an educator. I've been an educator for, I think I'm going on my 21st year. 
Um, I've worked in urban school districts my, my entire life. And so even in this conversation, it will have um, the context of urban and I'll speak to why that's important when it's time. Um, I grew up in Lancaster, um, born and raised. Um, I actually work in New York City now. I've worked in Lancaster City and I've also worked with um, partnering with school districts in uh, Philadelphia, Chester um, and Harrisburg. And so I have a, a broader urban context around um, South Central Pennsylvania. Um, I have three boys. I have a stepson who's 22, a 19 year old um, and a nine year old who you may hear um, from time to time. I'm trying to get them to, to allow me to focus but I have to be fully transparent. That's not always um, part of who he is or wants to be. So if there may be an interruption. I apologize early if that happens. <laughs> My name is Sheila O'Rourke. I'm also uh, um, an attorney at Gibble Crable and Hess with Dwight. Um, my practice focuses on land use and also civil rights. Um, I've been part of this seminar series from the beginning and I'm really grateful to be part of it. Um, another outlet for me is through the YWCA, um, which is a local organization that is dedicated to eliminating racism and empowering women. Um, so that is another place where I like to spend a lot of my time. Um, I have two kids who also may have something to say during the seminar, but I'll be muted most of the time, so you probably won't hear them. <clears throat> and I want to just um, name that uh, Reverend Bailey is a part of this. He's actually been um, a big part of it from the beginning. He, he pulled me in, and so um, he's unable to participate tonight, but we look forward to having him on the next seminar. All right, well, thanks. I think um, what just so everybody understands what we're gonna do is uh, Sheila and I are gonna give just a like a five or 10 minute uh, history lesson on some of the key events to just kind of orient ourselves in terms of uh, what Dr. Brown's gonna talk about later as it relates to um, the education system and how that connects to the history of slavery and discrimination in this country. So for those who, who've been on this uh, journey with us, you know that 1619 was when the first um, enslaved Africans came to the British North American colonies and they arrived there and quickly the, uh, the colonies institutionalized through laws, uh, a system of slavery. It was uh, chattel slavery, which means that people owned other people and sold them as property. And uh, that was a system that was put in place and established by the laws of the colonies. And then uh, if we can go to the next slide, continued um, you know, in the founding of our country. One of the things that we, we've talked about is looking back, you know, we have this Declaration of Independence um, and it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we often look at that as the genius of this country, that we were the, the, the shining star. Well, the reality of it is, you know, 50% of the founders all owned human beings. They all owned slaves. And Thomas Jefferson was one of the largest enslavers of our founding fathers. And that's just a fact of life. So we have to look at the history of our country through a lens that recognizes that this system, the constitution and the entire government was set up to protect a system of slavery that provided free labor for an economy. And that was set in motion very intentionally and purposefully uh, and has had consequences ever since. So we can go to the next slide. I'm going to have Sheila, we're, this is the real mini version of the history of our country. So we went from, we went from 1619 to 1776, and now we're going up to 1860. So I'll let Sheila do this, this portion. Sure. Um, so again, very briefly, um, the system of chattel slavery is instituted in our country for hundreds of years, um, and the Civil War occurs um, over the issue of slavery. 
And um, as part of the Civil War, which occurred from 1861 until 1865, seven Southern states secede um, from, from the country um, and four more states join them um, in their efforts to, to keep the institution of slavery. Um, the, the Civil War ended when the Confederate States surrendered in 1865. And so on the next slide, we introduced the period of reconstruction that occurred right at the tail end of the Civil War and lasted about seven years. Um, we have pictured Thaddeus Stevens here, which is uh, our, our local um, representative who at the time was one of the leading radical Republicans um, who were spearheading efforts towards reconstruction. And reconstruction is, um, is the time period that occurred right after the Civil War that we can think of as our country's second founding um, when radical Republicans and formerly enslaved African-Americans um, basically birthed a new system, a radically reformed system. And on the next slide, um, some of the accomplishments are listed around instituting for the first time systems of public education. Um, bringing social welfare programs, strengthening the rights of workers, making taxation more equitable, outlawing racial discrimination in transport and accommodation, economic development programs. And it's very important to realize that these programs not only benefited formerly enslaved African Americans, but also poor white folks. It did not last that long, and I'll hand it over to Dwight. All right. So after Reconstruction, which was really, Reconstruction was the process of, of reintegrating, uh, you know, millions of, of freed, uh, enslaved uh, Black folks into the country. And there were a lot of laws that were developed to facilitate that, including uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which are critical amendments to the Constitution. Uh, but uh, that, unfortunately, that era of Reconstruction, which gave uh, folks so much hope and there was so much progress, came to a crashing end and started uh, the, Jim, the Jim Crow era, which basically uh, took back many of the uh, rights and freedoms that had been granted and established during Reconstruction and reversed them so that while slavery was outlawed, the daily lives of, of, of Blacks that were freed reverted back to as if they were still enslaved in many ways. So you saw um, this concept called separate but equal, and that was based on states that essentially said, okay, well, we got through Reconstruction, and we know now that uh, blacks have to be treated equally, but we're going to basically set up a system that treats them equally through a separate process. So they passed state laws and local ordinances that prohibited blacks and whites from uh, being in the same establishments and uh, black folks were basically subjected to uh, you know, second class facilities and treatment and never had the same opportunities that uh, white people did. And so this was called Plessy v. Ferguson, and, and that was a case that went to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, under our Constitution, as amended by the Reconstruction Amendments, that was constitutional for states to set up this two-tier system. And that basically gave a green light to the states to legally discriminate against Blacks in all the laws that they passed in every aspect of life. And uh, that was the situation then that we refer to as the, as the Jim Crow era. There was also an attack on voting rights so that even though uh, post-Civil War and, and during Reconstruction, uh, Blacks had the, the right, at least Black men had the right to vote, there was a concerted effort to disenfranchise all Blacks 
through the use of violence and voter tests and all of these different requirements that essentially made it impossible for blacks to vote. And then there were attacks on individual and civil rights. And we can't forget that there was an intentional propaganda war that was wa raged, waged against blacks to define them in a certain way uh, and to portray them in ways that helped white people in some ways to, to try and justify the treatment that they were legally now doing through state laws and local laws. Uh, so we go to the next slide. What you saw then is in every aspect of life, uh, there were laws, state laws that treated blacks differently uh, from birth, from birth to death. There were laws that prohibited blacks from visiting white establishments. Of course, we're talking about education. Uh, this is a Missouri law from 1929. And it says it is unlawful for any colored child to attend any white school or any white child to attend a colored school. This is just very typical of the type of laws you would see. It was a completely separated, segregated society. And of course, whites had all the advantages and blacks had no resources uh, and, and very little opportunity to um, you know, fulfill their you know, God-given abilities and, and desires. So we can go to the next slide. Um, you probably all have heard of the, the United States Supreme Court decision called Brown v. Board of Education. This was a watershed decision by the Supreme Court that basically overturned Plessy v. Ferguson. And um, it said that it was unconstitutional to have separate educational facilities because they are inherently unequal, which of course is common sense, right? We knew that, but uh, now you know we had to wait, what, 60 to 70 years uh, during which the entire system was based on a segregated discriminatory system. Uh, so Brown v. Board of Education was a watershed decision but it was just that, a decision. It didn't necessarily implement anything. That, were, that was nine Supreme Court justices that said it was unconstitutional, but you had all these states that had enacted laws and developed schools in a way that segregated uh, blacks and whites. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, you know, late 50s, early 60s, you're beginning to see the fact that the civil rights movement is now pushing uh, folks that believed in white supremacy, that believed that whites and blacks should not be integrated. And uh, the Little Rock Nine uh, from, from Arkansas was just an example of the state governor bringing out uh, the national or the, the state uh, police and, and uh, to pro prohibit blacks from entering um, Central High, High School, which was required by the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board of Education. Um, and basically, the governor said, I will use whatever resources, whatever authority, whatever power I have to keep Black kids from going into white schools. So it was a massive res resistance to any type of integration. And, uh, you know, of course, the courage that these nine must have had to uh, face what was, was jeering white crowds, were, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to fathom that kind of courage. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, fast forward then to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This was a federal law that basically outlawed uh, discrimination in different areas of life, including public education. Uh, this was, again, landmark legislation that uh, essentially started to turn the corner on the Jim Crow era. But think about it. We had in place now a system of, of discrimination, of legalized discrimination for 80 years. And there's massive resistance to this change. Um, so 
again, this is an important law, but uh, only takes you so far. And we go to the next slide. Uh, and that's the that was the um, the very quick tour of history. And I think we're going to turn it now over to Dr. Brown. All right. Well, thank you, um, Dwight and, and Sheila. And so, you know, listening to some some of this, I think it, it really set the stage for the conversation that I'd like to have and really just talk about, um, you know, the context in which we're living in, because um, I, what the premise that I'm speaking to is that the laws were shaped, and like Dwight said, it was with, with well intention, but we live in a system of de jour and de facto segregation in our school systems. Like, and I think we have to be able to name that. And so what I wanna speak to is just the different um, contextual factors that impact um, school districts that serve um, African-American students and our students of color. Um, speaking specifically around African-American students, but I, I do wanna name that the, this impacts um, students of color across the country. Um, and so this is this is our fountain of public education. Um, you know, we have a system of have and have nots, and there really isn't anything in between. And as as Dwight had named, you know, the Brown v. Board of Education was an attempt to dismantle that. But what happened? Every attempt to dismantle anything um, to to create forward progress for African Americans, there were always different pieces coming through that said, "Oh no, oh no." This is this is not going to happen, and so this idea of desegregation is what I like to name it. Really, doesn't exist um, in in our in our public schools, and I don't know if anyone has any context of public schools now. But we went to school, um, and if you if you reference your experience in education, I, I'd like you to sit and think about you know what folks may have perceived as diversity and their lack lack thereof. Um, I think you know. If anyone has a context of Lancaster City, you may be at McCaskey where you'll look in and you'll see the diverse population and, and all the languages. But if you go deeper into the neighborhoods, the neighborhoods are still divided um, uh, by race. And, and urban school districts specifically are, are divided that way. So, you know, what I what I'm speaking to is this concept of intersectionality, and it's the, the interconnected nature of social categorization, such as race and class. And that's really what our country um, sought to create and, and, and has created um, for us. And it's, it's just multi-layered. And so we're dealing with racism, we're dealing with classism, we're dealing with issues of redlining, we're dealing with issues of criminalization, all coming together to create um, our, our schools, our school systems, because that is where our children go. Hey, Danielle, can I just jump in here? Mm -hmm. One of the things that strikes me just as you, you, you get started here is, the systems that were put in place during the Jim Crow era basically are in many ways still in place. For example, it was legal to discriminate on where Blacks could live. You could have deed restrictions and laws that said Blacks could not live in this residential development. Um, and that has consequences just because those laws are now um, illegal, doesn't mean that the historic patterns based on those laws aren't still with us. They are very much with us. And you see that, and that then bleeds into all of these other things. So uh, it, it, there's a direct connection here between the, the, that historical system of discrimination and what we are facing now. Right, because because what had hap what happened was you have you have district leaders and lawmakers who came together to create these predominantly white middle class neighborhoods and predominantly poor African American neighborhoods, and that's then who go to the schools, and that and that is definitely what what's happened. You know, and so I just wanted to to cite the Children's Defense Fund, which is very very powerful research. If any, and, and they have things, but this is the most dangerous place to grow up is the intersection of poverty and race, better known as urban school districts and neighborhoods. Um, that's very powerful. When I read it, um, it it hit me for several reasons. I, I know I shared this with several of you. I'm a product of an urban school district. Um, I grew up in poverty, um, and I work in an urban school district, and so. The idea that I've lived and worked in danger for a long time, um, you know, hits me at my gut um, for a lot of reasons. 
Um, and and one of the, the biggest reason, actually it is the biggest reason, is that we've always been challenged with the idea of this versus. We have a problem or we are the problem. And you know, our country still today will post, you know, urban school, they'll take test scores. I, I, you'll see, they'll post the test scores of every school district and always you see the urban district at the bottom. Why? Because they're creating this, this, this narrative that we are the problem. That still plays out. And see, one of the things that, that, that urban school districts are up against, and I'm speaking specifically because this is where the intersectionality of both poverty and race, this is what our country has created. And you may have, you may have places where you see like, you know, well, in my neighborhood, there's some black folks that go to this school, there's not at the level in which um, it is in urban districts. But, the, but what we face is this idea, you know, that it's not happening that they are the problem. And, and this is this ideology around colorblind racism and, and, and just this colorblindness. Perfect example, connected, but not necessarily connected to education is what just happened a week or two ago with the um, impeachment, right? Like we just wanna act like this didn't happen and continue on and act like we didn't create this system for these people to act like this. We're gonna blame the people versus the system when everyone needs to be accountable for it. And this is the same cycle um, that's been happening for us. And this, this happens consistently in, um, in, in our education system. And it, so, it, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you, so on that prior slide, you, you have um, this notion of a white person saying, hey, I don't, I don't see color, you know? Uh, and I, I'm just curious, when you hear a white person say that, which I think in many ways is a defensive mechanism to make it seem like they want to be, uh, I don't know, that they, that if by not seeing color, that somehow they're not uh, racist. Uh, but how does that feel to you as a black woman when you hear a white person say that? It goes back to the dismissive, like, oh, you then I have a problem, right? If I'm if I have a problem, it's not about because I don't see color. It goes back to me saying, oh, you you are the problem, right? Versus there is a problem here. It it it, it it's a blinder, and it 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 just it's dismissive, very, but it just it separates from that there is a problem to know Danielle, you're the one with the problem. That's really kind of like how it it ends up being, um, typically, and and you know I I. I had said this in a couple other sessions. Um, I think we really, really need to unpack the concept of privilege. I think it, it has created some serious mental health um, across our country that if I was in another doctoral program, I probably would research that because there, there is some serious, in my mind, some mental health around that, you know, that we're sitting here blatantly ignoring things and acting as if they don't exist and continuing to perpetuate a system and the unhealthiness behind that, because that's, for me, how I perceive it. You know, and that's just my lens, like you said, from an African-American female, from having to wake up every day, you know, up against white spaces, you know, there, you, you know that you're different. But when you, when you grow and you live in a society that always that tells you everything you do is okay, or that there's a way to make it okay, you know, that, in my mind, in my, my perception, is create some unhealthy habits. Um, and, and some of the things, like I said, we just saw play out in our country. And they I think from- play out from a white person's perspective, this is A, a very ignorant thing to say, and B, is just flat out wrong. Look at the history of our country. We have laws that have recognized the color of someone's skin, okay? So to, to, to suggest that as a white person built on a system that has advantaged us, that you don't see color, uh, is just flat wrong. And, and I can understand why it would be very offensive, but I, I just hope all my white friends hear that. Like, that's not a helpful thing. That I think is, is, is um, you know, basically showing our ignorance uh, by saying that because we all see color. You can't live in this country. You can't look at the news you can't turn the TV on and not see color because the propaganda that has been instituted from way back when continues. So I'm sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox. Go ahead. That's Jamie. okay. You can be on your soapbox. <laughs> and you know, it, here it is. And here's this is a stat that you know to pull out. You know, 
at, at one point, you know, in 2019, only 50% of white Americans believed that race relations in the United States was bad. And only 54% believed that it was a, a major obstacle. And so, you know, we're, we're juxtaposed between two things, that, that idea that I can't breathe, you're killing me. Oh, what, I can't see this. And part of what, back again, you know, this all plays out as an educator within the four walls of a school system. It plays out daily. These are the things that we are up against. And so we have these hundreds of programs and they say, this is a new initiative. We're, that is not going to, to grow our schools and grow our children until we really stop playing this I can't see game and really think about this in a larger context. And so you had spoke to some of the, the history, you know, of the race relations. And I just wanted to hit this up, you know, there was a, a slave block that was just removed in 2020. And again, you know, our nation was just up against all these removing the statues. But, you know, it, I remember going to, to Charlottesville and, and walking into Freedom Park with the statue of Robert E. Lee. Like that, again, to me, it, 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 as an educator, it's, it makes no sense because I'm crossing two things. And so this is, this is what our country continues to perpetuate. And this is what, again, our children are up against. And so again, you know, we've been in this in this system of separate and unequal since the beginning. And I think that there were there were attempts to dismantle it, um, but it 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 never it never dismantled it, and it continued to create more systems to create some intersectionality. So what we're dealing with um, is high levels of concentrated poverty on top of racism. We're dealing with with systems of violence and criminalization poverty on top of the racism. All of that shows up at the door of a school system. Here, right here, Mississippi town finally desegregated. This was a newspaper article. So I'm not talking about the desegregation that like that, that just didn't happen. They finally said, okay, we're going to do this in 2017. And, and here, I spoke to this a little bit, but here goes some data behind it. You know, black students are six times more likely than white students to attend high poverty schools. Um, the racial concentration of school poverty is so severe that black and white students effectively attend two different school systems. One for middle and upper um, middle income white students, another for poor students and students of color. And this, is an, this was just a picture in the back of a school in Philadelphia. You know, and, and this is, this, this is the reality. Um, you know, aesthetics are important. Neighborhoods are important. And so we have children that are attending schools that just don't even look healthy when you walk up to it. As a result of the concentration of this racialized poverty that's happening in our, in our schools. And, and, and it always comes back to, oh, they are a problem. Oh, they go to that school, oh my gosh. And that's how people talk about it. But the reality is this is what's created in our country. And so, Again, um, by segregation by both poverty and race. Um, and again, this is just a neighborhood. This is a neighborhood in Philadelphia. This is a neighborhood that our children live in because we have this concentration um, of both poverty and race. And when we talk about the criminalization, um, and, and I wanna I speak to this because, you know, lynching, I think it was between the, between um, I think 1860. Let me find this data. It was like 1860 to like 1920. There were over 4,000 um, African Americans lynched. It became the, the highest form of domestic terrorism. But if you look, there's not much difference between these two pictures. This was 1920. This was 2020. These are, these are my children's fathers. I think that's the part that I wanna make sure I'm, I'm getting across. These are the children's fathers that, that, that are attending the schools because we have this concentration um, of both race, the criminalization, the crime, the violence, the poverty, all happening. And again, it shows up at our doors. When we talk about the criminalization, this is the incarceration rate um, 
for, for um, African Americans, Hispanics, and whites. And so I wanted to pull this figure out because this is important to note. Again, these are our children's fathers. I want to make sure I'm making the connection because you can't you can't teach a kid that is traumatized, right? We have to deal with the trauma. We have to deal with all the contextual factors that are impacting them. This is what's impacting them. On top of right now, we're adding to a level of poverty because if these parents aren't connected to their child to create an income, now we're in, we're increasing the poverty in our schools. One in 50 children in the U.S. has a parent in prison. And so, and Danielle, let me just, just add, um, and we've talked about this in some of the other seminars, but it, it's not hard to trace this back in our history from after Reconstruction, a lot of states and some uh, local municipalities adopted ordinances or laws that basically made not having a job, a crime, or vagrancy, a crime. And so there were, you know, millions of freed um, enslaved Africans that had no jobs. And so they were immediately charged and put in jail after Reconstruction uh, and incarcerated. And then they were basically rented back to their former owners to work the field. So this system of using the criminal justice system and incarceration has continued on. And, and you see the, the whole notion of mass incarceration that occurred um, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where um, you know, federal and state laws were put in place that were specifically designed to incarcerate particularly black men and it worked. And these are systems that are in place. These, this didn't happen by accident. This is what this country has done and put in place. And until you understand that, you know, you, 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 it's hard to process what's going on today. But once you understand that, that these are systems that are there, um, this frankly is not that surprising. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, and it it's working. I mean, and and so what I wanted to highlight, I'm gonna go to this um, the sentencing project. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this, but this has a lot of powerful data um, on it um, that just talks to the stats. And you know, the 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 purpose of the sentencing project was to really reshape the criminal justice system by promoting the reforms. Um, but you know, here here goes some information. Let me just pull some up just to. Um, and so this is just juvenile custody rate. So uh, we were talking about fathers, um, but this is juvenile custody rate. And if we look at just the stats in PA, um, here it is. It's not hard to go deeper into some of this information. Um, and I'll go to PA because PA, you know, it's atrocious. You know, they call it Pensatucky um, with, with the information. Um, the number of people incarcerated um, in state prisons, and so let's find our country, I mean, our state, where are we at? Right here we go. When you look at this, the ratio, and let me see if I can find the, the ratio, we we're up in like the top 10 for um, the disproportionate number of um, numbers of African-American um, males that we have in prison. This, you can just type in the sentencing project and you can go to these um, state by state facts to go into a lot more detail because this, I could spend the whole seminar really just going into and fleshing out. Um, but based on some of their research, they said that one in three African-American males born in 2001 can expect to be incarcerated during their lifetime. I put this in my dissertation and what I'm reading off of because my child was born in 2001. My son was born in 2001. That right there, again, is a gut check and, and, and has a lot of implications for the work that I do, not only as a parent, but as an educator. You know, So 
one of the things we want to, again, just note that, you know, I had said it, let me see if I can get back to where I was at. Um, I apologize, let me. So one of the things, just give me a minute while I'm talking, so I'll, I wanted to note was, is that we have, you know, these fathers that are incarcerated, but we also have this school to prison pipeline as well um, that occurs in the education system. You know, where, where school prisons were looking at achievement data of third grade students to determine if they were gonna build a prison in a neighborhood. Like that's real stuff. And that's happening. And are not looking at achievement data in neighborhoods of predominantly middle-class white America. They're looking at achievement data in, in racialized, impoverished neighborhoods. And so here's just a few more statistics that were just pulled off of the sentencing project, you know, um, just to kind of bring home the point around what's happening around the criminalization of, of um, African-Americans. Sometimes it's more powerful for you to read it than for me to say it. So I just pause. And so one of the other issues, and this started from the beginning, you know, is the economic disparity, right? And so we have slavery, um, and then all of a sudden you're free, right? Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you have a job. It doesn't mean we're going to pay you. It doesn't mean we're going to give you any, any reparations. There is no, there is no, you know, inherited wealth typically in the African-American community. And it's one of the things that, um, you know, African-Americans face. And so this is the wealth divide over three decades. This right here shows up at the doors of a school system because these are parents of the children that I serve. And if you can look, you see like the difference, but not only that, you see from 1983 to 2016, there was decline for African-Americans. One of the biggest hits um, was deindustrialization. De um, you know, it plagued the, Af the neighborhood because, again, speaking to this, the contextual space, you know, a lot of African Americans after you know slavery, you know, went into urban neighborhoods. Right? It was this urban migration because of a lot of different re reasons that I spoke to, and so the deindustrialization then, again, families hit hard um, in neighborhoods. And this is just a picture of a neighborhood. We speak a little bit to the poverty and, and the idea of concentrated poverty um, as well, because this is one of the, the, the heaviest lifts um, that, that we have. I know I had spoke to a few of you guys before about a situation, um, and that was, a, uh, that was not a unique situation. I've, I've served children that slept under bridges every day. Um, so this is, this is the reality of what's happening. These children still have to go to school, because if they don't go to school, their parents will be fined. And if their parents are fine, they have no money and they go to jail. Like this is the cycle of what happens. And it's not a unique cycle. The cycle I'm talking about is not unique. And so nearly one out of every five children are poor. 70% of those children are children of color. That's one and out of every three children in our country. And that's a stat from 2017, which Considering this pandemic, unfortunately, I would venture to say it's probably a little higher at this point. And so here it just breaks it down. I had spoken to it, but this is just to present, you know, the percent of students in high poverty schools, um, you know, people of color, white. I spoke to this a couple different times, a couple different ways, but here goes just the data just to show that I'm not making this up. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the other things, um, contextual factor, is this real estate game, right? And I actually pulled two real examples um, off of the real estate website um, two days ago, 
just to show in our own neighborhood. And I use Lancaster, you know, so we have a Manheim Township School District and we have a um, Lancaster City School District. That's where these two schools are and the rankings. And so what real estate companies are doing is they're ranking schools, right? They're saying, oh, that's, again, we have a problem or we are the problem. This is, we are the problem story. This is the story that is told on every real estate website right now that families look to and determine the neighborhood they're going to live in as a result of how they're determining, deciding to rank. And what are they using? They're using achievement data. And they're saying, oh, the achievement data that's in the papers that they're saying, oh, these kids aren't scoring these kids. I'm going to this neighborhood. And so it's further creating this divide between the have and the have nots. And it's further, further creating this divide around racialized poverty. Again, it, and all you have to do is look, if, if some of us may have already done it, you know, it decided, you know, where they're going to live that way um, <clears throat> and, and use that. This is another system that continues to perpetuate the segregation. One of the biggest issues we have is school funding. And so basically what happens is, is that every state is allowed to create their funding formula and they're allowed to determine what they're going to do to give money. Um, on top of what the states give, every community then provides funding to the school. Well, when you have communities that are already impoverished or you have communities that where you have doubled up housing, you have communities with a lot of apartments, you're not going to get as much um, funds from real estate. But if you have a community that has a Walmart in it, you, you have a community that has the Best Buy over here, neighborhoods get funds for that. Like, for example, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Lidditz, but Lidditz has that whole big, um, I forget what it's called, but it's this big, big organization in Lidditz that is like sprawling and the community is sprawling. That goes to Warwick School District. That funding goes to Warwick School District. They get money from that. Where you have you have other neighborhoods where what the deindustrialization where companies are shutting down or or you know small businesses are, sh are shutting down within cities all of those taxes would go into the school they no longer get it but states still have this formula where they're allocating funds but they don't make adjustments based off of those things they decide based off of what they want to decide pennsylvania has historically in the past 20 30 years have has had organizations pushing against this um school funding, actually the school district of Lancaster um, has, you know, has filed suit against the state of Pennsylvania for fair funding because what they're allocating to schools does not provide the needs for the kids that they serve. Hey, Danielle, and, and just, just to kind of build on that, you know, states, each state can fund their schools differently. So for example, Virginia funds their schools at a statewide level based on a state income tax. Pennsylvania uses property taxes to fund schools. So what that means is the communities that have higher property values, those folks are paying higher school district taxes. So those schools are getting a lot more in funding. If you, if you turn back the clock 20, 30, 40 years, we had legalized discrimination on where people could live, right? So this this um, this unfair funding based on property taxes perpetuates directly a system of discrimination that was put in place following Reconstruction. It directly continues that system. And if you've been reading the news, there has been a lot of talk about fair funding and allocating it. And frankly, there is one political party in the state, you know, General Assembly that's opposed to doing that. And so what you have here is a continuation of a system that is based on the history of discrimination in this country, and it just perpetuates it. So I just think people have to understand that the property-based school taxes that fund districts has a direct connection to the history of this country. And, and, you know, even digging into that more. And so you look at <clears throat> the gerrymandering or how they, how they decided boundaries of districts. If you ever take Pennsylvania specifically 
has 500 school districts or 499 or 501, depending on the year, because some become in it, but the range between 499 and 501 school districts. And when you look at the school districts, if you take York County or Lancaster County, you can see where they drew the line around the urban area and up and through. And basically what they did, this redlining is what, what it's called, is what they did was they separated neighborhoods by income and wealth and by color, and they just went through. And that's the school system. This is York City School District. This is West York. This is Lancaster City. This is Manheim Township. This is Conestoga uh, Valley. Kind of still go valid. Like they've se it's separated that way very clearly. And when you, you just take a map and you look at it, you can see this is what they've done. And then you look at, you know, I think York City, York City has the highest taxes in the county. And so we're looking at a city that has a, an issue of acute and concentrated poverty, having the highest taxes in the county. That is an issue. And when you look at the school funding formula, what's happening is, is that the schools, is, they're not getting what they need. And so urban districts, as a result of this, are often in this cycle of cutting programming. And so the, the fight around, well, you know, kids need art, kids need music, kids need, that is, that is what districts are faced with. I remember it was, in Lancaster City, a couple years uh, years back, when we first had to make the cuts, I found out at 1:30 I had to tell my gym teacher he no longer had a job the next day because of the cuts in school funding. The implications for that, right? So we have children who come to school. We have children who are coming to school that are that are impacted by poverty, that are impacted by violence, and now they have no outlet, right? When you talk about the ideas and and, and I'm, and the, the concept around what's happening in a school and what's needed, we're taking away from the kids who need it the most continuously. We created a system that feeds this and then we're taking away the things they need. And, and the biggest issue we have is, is just the idea of being able to just provide resources. And, and going back to the picture of that school building, can I just paint my school walls? But if I had to decide between making sure that the kid has, you know, the teacher in front of them and paint on the outside wall, I'm going to make sure that the child has a teacher in front of them. These are the things that urban districts are faced with every day, consistently. These are the conversations that superintendents have to have consistently because they're trying to rob Peter to pay Paul to make it work as a result of school funding. This map right here shows how schools are funded. And averages, and, and I show this map because if you look closer, you can see some you can see some trends here around where African American population is um, and where school funding is not. And so we look here. This is where we are. This is what they call the poverty belt. This is a large population of African Americans, but these are cities. These are urban neighborhoods. This is, this is what it is. And then you see places where it's well above, well above. And I think, I don't know if Rev or Dwight has spoke to this a while ago um, when we were originally talking about the idea of slavery and discrimination and, and the notion that it all happened in the South, right? That nothing happened in the North. But when you look at the, the school funding, you can clearly see North's looking pretty, pretty nice. And, and these, this is a system of separate and unequal spaces. This is the system where you can clearly see the have and the have nots. And so we also have something called the education pipeline, um, you know, where we can create the system of kids going here or going here um, is basically what, you know, it's the process of educational attainment through an articulated system of schools and post-secondary institutions. Um, you know, it, it shows where students are going to go. The, the education pipeline is tied to the school to prison pipeline. It's tied to the economic pipeline. People are looking at the data of how students do in third grade to determine what to do next. 
this is an example um, of achievement by poverty and race for eighth grade. And this is from a national test um, that's given to different schools across the country. Um, they do it every year. They, they randomly select schools. I was a, a selected school for a few years um, to participate, but this is an interesting piece of data. <clears throat> it's interesting for a lot of reasons. If you look at the students that are in poverty and scoring below basic, a white student that lives in poverty, 76% chance of scoring below basic, an African-American student not in poverty. This is the intersectionality. These are the things that are going, this is the complexity of all the things that are happening. And the reason why I put this up too is because what tends to happen sometimes <laughs> is that when we talk about intersectionality, folks like to live into the idea of poverty being the main issue. Poverty is a layered issue on top of the racism, the, what the white spoke to in the beginning, what happened in 1619, and it just became overlaid with different things, poverty being the biggest overlay. <clears throat> this is just a, a stat um, with some data um, behind student debt, which, which comes up. So if, if if and when an opportunity would arise in the education pipeline, there's still an issue behind student debt. Because speaking to the income gap, right? Because we have, what, what ends up happening is this layered problem, this layered issue. So as an African-American student, I do, I do make it to a level where I'm able to attain a bachelor's or an associate's degree. I don't have generational wealth to, to tap into because of the wealth gap that occurred way back when. This is all happening again in our school system. Danielle, let me just add too that I've heard it said that wealth for whites goes from one generation to the next. It goes down and wealth for blacks goes uh, basically up. In other words, uh, there's, there is a, a children need to, to help support uh, their parents. And it's a, and it's, it goes again back to the history of this country. 400 years ago, you know, we started this system of slavery. And then really until what, the, the late 1960s, did we begin to try and have a fair playing field, which was just a very start? Uh, think about the generational wealth that was lost for those generations of African Americans. Think about that for a moment, and then think about the notion of how the families, black families, can ever build that wealth because they're they're dealing with basically supporting another generation that um, you know never had those opportunities. I think of simple things like the equity in your home and how important that is. The ability to get a home equity line of credit. Um, if, if you're in a jam or you wanna do something, those are things that white people just take for granted. But a lot of that is developed over generations, over having privileges and opportunities that uh, Black families have never had that chance because of the history of discrimination. And when I say history, I mean, that makes it sound like it's in the past. It's not in the past. So I, I think, you know, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And so the school to prison pipeline, which, which I referenced um, as well, you know, is, is another issue that is faced. Um, and so this is just um, really where they're looking at disciplinary policies um, that hinder academic achievement, um, that create retention dropout rates and involve in the criminal justice system. You know, one of the things that urban school districts picked up a few years back was this, this idea or concept of school police officers. This now is being up for question. I know LA um, school district just more recently, I think within the last few weeks um, decided to to lean into the idea of the defund the police and they shift it in the way in which they're going to manage, um, you know, discipline and behavior. But what, what they were finding was, is that, you know, a black student and a white student will commit the same offense and the discipline for this child 
is way more harsh than the discipline for this child to the point of um, police charges. And that, that's what's happening still in our, in our schools. Here goes a piece of data. Um, and this is from uh, Jefferson Parish School District in, in Louisiana. And the reason why I, I cited this data was interestingly enough, when Abraham Lincoln um, said that you know, all slaves were free in non-rebellious states. This was an area that they didn't have to free the slaves just because they were non-rebellious in this one in this one parish. And so even years later, you know, this this is the theme that still continues. But if you look at the number of arrests, we're talking about children arrested in school. I mean, the idea of children arrested in school in a broader context is heavy. When you look at the, 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 the disparities between the two, this is an issue. This is happening in school districts across the country. And so, you know, what I wanted to highlight, and I, and I hope I had the opportunity to, was just the, the contextual factors that impact the, the school system in this country. I mean, we, we talk about, you know, how, how African Americans are, are impacted, but the bottom line is, is that most African American children attend different school systems than their white counterparts. And the school systems are separate and unequal and layered. And so going back to Brown v. Board, I just wanna, I just wanna name this. When African Americans and white children had separate schools before Brown v. Board, one of the things that African American students had was someone who stood in front of them that looked like them, that loved them, that knew them, educating them. That no longer existed after Brown v. Board because what they said was, is that your, kid, your kids can come to our schools, but your teachers can't. And so one of the issues I did not highlight was that issue. Because what also happens in urban school district is that we have this um, issue where we'll have teachers come into our schools, get professional development and get some street cred and leave. And they go to their, they go to their suburban schools to teach. And so this rollover in teachers is another issue we face. But these are the schools that our children attend. And this is the issue you know, I wanted to know. And I wanted to be very clear that I am not the problem. And I say I am as a child in an urban district as an African-American, I am not the problem. What I wanna note is, is that we have a problem. And fixing the problem is, does not mean fixing me. It means fixing the system. So thank you guys. Um, and I can open it up to questions if you have any. Or comments or concerns. I have a quick question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I uh, have worked in charter schools in Philadelphia, and I know that's like a big piece of school segregation puzzle. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see charter schools and school segregation kind of working together or not. I. You know, I think it's one of those things that we've gotten fooled by um, in, in, in our education system because what's happened is, and, and I don't want to actually name like that I'm completely like charters are bad, not at all. You know, people got frustrated with the system and said, you know what, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it this way. What happened was with that frustration, the larger system said, oh, well, if you decide to create your own, we're gonna take from the school system that's already impoverished. And so you create that separation. Charters have the option to decide who they educate. Ur school so I'll, like as an urban school district, as an example, one of the things like, so I would cite that for, for me, if I was educating a student with special ed, it would cost me per year, maybe 15 to $17,000. If I have a charter school in my district that's educating that same child, I'm paying them upwards of 25,000 to $30,000 per year coming out of my funding. It's taking away from me and the state system created that, right? So it's not so much that charters and, and, and the other school districts said this is, the state created that. And so now you have these two systems that are trying to do what's best for kids at odds and one is stripping the other. 
because the intent was to to create to fix something that they thought was broken. And, and so it's just like it, 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 almost like this concept of crabs in a barrel for me. Like it plays into this cycle, and and it does create the segregation because we. When I get to choose who I educate, I think that inherently, you know, creates it. I have a Where question. Public schools don't. Go ahead. I have a question. Do we know, are there states in the United States whose school systems are patterned on a statewide <laughs> per student system for the state taxes? Because so, I know we don't in Pennsylvania. Some of them do countywide, um, some do state. Um, and, and so some are better than the others. And I'm trying to think there was there was one in the Midwest that was a little better than the others. I think it was, um, for some reason I'm thinking it was Wisconsin because at one point they decided they weren't gonna take federal funding because they felt like it was, um, it was counter to what they were trying to do around equity. But I, I really can't remember even still with the funding piece, the other systems disrupted. Like when you look at some of the Midwestern countries, um, excuse me, states, they deal with the issue around the Native American um, and the cycle of, of, you know, the system against them, like living on reservations and, and stripping the land and all those pieces. And so they have that context overlaid with theirs, even if they have the funding. And I would just add to that, um, I know, for example, Virginia, um, does not have property taxes that go to, to school funding. They would have the kind of the municipal county level tax, but they have a higher income tax. So I'm not sure what their formula is for distributing that, but it's going at a state level through an income tax across the board. And then there's a formula for how that's distributed to school districts. So I think the answer to the question is absolutely. <clears throat> there are states that do not rely on property taxes to fund their schools, which inherently provides a more equitable mechanism for distributing it. School district property taxes um, perpetuate a system that was built upon discrimination in housing and you know, generational wealth that it's very hard to reverse. Uh, well, for a comment first, uh, and, and Danielle, I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, and yeah, it, it, you know, it makes sense. It's multi-layered. It's multifaceted. Uh, the problems run deep. Uh, so, so kind of two questions. Uh, one, what gives you hope? What keeps you going? And, and number two, uh, for those of us with the white faces, uh, what can we do? You know, honestly, what gives me hope is is I, I, I authentically believe that I'm called for a purpose. I think that God put me in a place to do the work. You know, what gives me hope is the idea that, you know, historically, you know, studying, this isn't, this isn't the first go around of, of being in 400 years of something, right? Like, and if anyone's faith-based, you know, understand, like, you know, the, Isra the, the Israelites were in 400 years of bondage. And so, there's, there's spaces to come out. And I think the idea that, that I think my purpose is to disrupt the system. And so I know that it's a heavy lift. And so that gives me hope knowing that that is what my purpose is. I think um, for all of us, it, it really is understanding the idea that we have a problem. We have a collective problem and people are not the problem. And, and, the, and the last thing we have to, the thing we have to stop doing is saying our children are the problem because they're not. We have a problem. And the problem in our school systems, 99.99999% are always created by adults. And, and when we can walk and own that and really say, what is my part in this? And, and ways in which I can, like even just around the fair funding piece, which is big in PA, like, you know, being advocating around that, understanding what's happening on school boards, you know, really kind of like fleshing those things out because while we have this funding issue, schools are impacted by levels. We have the federal level, we have the state level, and then we have the level in which, you know, the local schools serve. I'm really understanding those pieces. But for me, the biggest piece is really just understanding that the 
kids are not the problem. We have a problem though. Danielle, if I could just add a thought to that as well, and this is something that I've grown to understand or appreciate, which is white people created the problem. And in large part, white people are going to have to figure out how to fix the problem. That doesn't mean that it's not a collective effort, but the notion that somehow this is a black problem that needs to be fixed is fundamentally wrong. We created this. We're the ones with the power. And again, it's hard to know what the answer is. It's hard to know what steps to take, but we're the ones who got to figure it out, right? I mean, we're the ones who put this in place. This is, this is our project. This is our project and this is what we own. So, uh, you know, we're hoping that part of this process is figuring out what do we do. Right. This is Napoleon. I enjoyed Alan's question. I enjoyed what you're saying. It is our problem. It's not only a white problem. We all have a stake in this to make a better society. And I sent you a message offline, and hopefully we'll all together find a way for a better path. Yeah, thanks, Napoleon. I mean, I think that's right. But I don't think we can ignore that white people created this system. White people have the power and the privilege. And uh, fundamentally, it's our system. Absolutely. Our forebearers created it, and we've perpetuated it. But we have to find a way to make a better path for the future. We all, together, have to find a way to make a better path for the future. My opinion. One of the things that I wanted to highlight that I spoke to earlier was the idea of naming it, right? So part of the issue we run into is that we cycle in the truth. It takes us a while to just get to the point that this is what it is, right? This is what happened. I, I keep on going back to we just saw a play out, you know, in the news, you know, with the impeachment where fo folks are acting like that it was an insurrection. Oh, no, there was, there was, we have to name it. There were good people there. We can name a lot of things. We have to name that our capital was almost taken over. Like we have to name that, but, but what we do is we spend time cycling and making people feel good or no, that really didn't happen. Or did he did he commit a crime? Oh, they, they shot him because, because what? We spend so much time in that space that we really don't name, this is really what's happening. This is, this is the truth of, about what is going on. And, and that is part of our issue as a country, I think. It's sorry, like, I didn't cut someone off. Um, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Brown. I'm sorry, Danielle. Um, I was just curious if we no longer have children in school systems and we feel built out of touch, or if we feel that we're not. I guess what I'm asking do you have organizations that you know that could use monetary support that are being run uh, by people who are knowledgeable of ways that uh, can be of help? Um, do you have any places that we can direct our, our finances if we want to contribute? Um, there are there are partnerships that different schools have. I think different schools reach out to different, like if you're thinking in terms of that. I know, um, like off the top of my head, one of the things that might, and I don't know, this is just a thought, childcare is an issue right now um, for families. Families have to go back to work and some kids aren't back in school. So there's some, there's a space there that could be of support, you know, thinking about maybe reaching out to some childcare centers and seeing maybe sponsoring you know, it, it, it could be an isolated situation. I know that there was support around a family that needed access, you know, to internet because kids weren't in school. There's so many different things that are popping up now. Um, I would say like maybe just look into some um, local organizations like the Y, you know, WCA that, that may already have some, some outreach going on. And or one of the things that school districts have taken on is the idea of social workers. And they basically are boots to the ground and they have that lens. And so even if you wanted to reach directly out to the school, I would reach directly out to the social worker and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in doing something, 
what are your needs? And and they would be able to, like, I can tell you now, my, my school social worker, if you told her, she'd be like, oh, look. <laughs> and this family, this family, you know, it, so that's one thing too that 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 is happening and schools have taken on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nick Kohlberg has had his hand up so long. I want to hear what he says. I can't see. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jake. I'm sorry. I, I, I thank you for that, Jack. Uh, you know, it, from the, the information and the slides that Danielle were putting up, it, it's pretty clear that the one of the basic problems is just plain old money. Um, if you look at the, I think it was very telling in the one slide that showed the, the median wealth you know, of, of whites was 160,000 or something like that. And, and, and for the African-Americans or the blacks, it was what, three or $5,000. Um, I was on a, on a meeting this morning and the two main speakers were two women from the local YWCA, a very, very great presentation. Um, but in the Q and A, one of the, one of the women and, Many of the people on the call were from Willow Valley and the woman was commenting that she had moved here, I think like three years ago to, to Willow Valley uh, from I think Virginia. And she said, but it's so white. Well, you look at, you look at the, the cost of places like Willow Valley or many of the retirement facilities around Lancaster County, it costs a lot of money to get into those places. And you know, with with the wealth gap like that, there's just an awful an awful lot of nice living, if you will, that the, the black population will never ever be able to afford. If you change the whole system today, and started with the schools and properly funding the schools and so forth, you're looking at another generation before it would bear fruit. And I I, I don't have the answer, and it's just it's frustrating to see it because I don't see how we fix it. Yeah, and following up on the, the question that was asked previously about contributing perhaps funds uh, to an organization, um, I, I guess, the, first of all, yeah, Danielle, that, that presentation was very um, informative. So I, I really, appreciate, really appreciate that, yeah. Um, but, um, it, it, um, <clears throat> Buddy Glover, um, he passed, I guess, a couple, a couple weeks ago. Uh, he was an educator. And uh, part of, you know, instead of sending flowers, he had his money and funds donated towards the Advantage Group. Advantage Lancaster. Advantage Lancaster, yeah. Mm -hmm. It comes out of um, Ever in Hand. I call it Ever in Hand Middle, middle School. I guess now, um, so that would that would be one source that I would I would know about, and perhaps uh, you can look into that that part <clears throat> to find that. Yeah, I put their names in the um, chat. Um, it's it was started by two black male educators, um, Ty Bear and Shane Meadows. Um, I actually used to be on the board, and that they definitely and and Buddy Glover was a mentor of mine. So yeah. Thank you, Mr. Polite, because I, I forgot about that. Yep. Okay. And that's a wonderful organization. I don't see it in the chat. Oh, you know what? I sent a direct message. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize I had a direct message. Hannah, can you, um, uh, the organization's called Advantage Lancaster. They're, they're both um, educators at Edward Hand Middle School or Southeast area right now is what it's called. But um, that is another, and, and the, the program is wonderful. Also, I guess, Danielle, just, you know, you, you're familiar with uh, Umar Johnson's work? Mm -hmm, I went to Millersville with him. <laughs> oh, do you know him then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're familiar with what he, what mm -hmm. he does. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Boy, Boyce Watkins, familiar with him? Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I say one of the things the gentleman asked about, Daniel, how uh, how do you get hope? Yeah. Yes, so Ms. Kathleen. <laughs> one, of, one of the things, um, this whole seminar is something that gives me hope. Everybody that's on the, uh, in the seminar, 
when you get off of this seminar, you go back and share this information with someone else. Don't just take it and sit home with it. Go. Money is wonderful. We need money, but people need knowledge too. You need to put put things into into action. Um, so share share the information with your white friends. What you what you've listened to today, and if you learned something or saw something new, share it. And the next time you get in a conversation with someone, sometimes challenge challenge your friends to look into something different. I came to work the day after the insurrection at Washington. I could have stayed home because I was pretty angry about what I saw, but I came to work because, and some of it is because of the seminar that, that Gibble, Crable, and Hess, and Bethel have put together. That's, this is a hopeful thing for me. This is spreading information to people. It is encouraging people to come together and talk and learn. So I came to work that day because I didn't want to stay home and be angry. I want to uh, continue to support Gibble, Crable, and Hess in this effort. I could have stayed home and just bust in front of the TV, but Gibble, Crable, and Hess, and Bethel are trying, trying to keep things uh, moving and learning. And I think everybody that participates here, take, take your information and share it. If you want to give money or if just speak to other people, stop some conversations sometimes. Encourage them to come and join us. That's powerful, Ms. Kathleen, I think because the name it piece. So there's this framework that I'm learning about called see it, name it, do it. You got to be able to see it, see the gap, and you got to be able to name it. So then you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And to do it, and to do it is relative to what you can handle. And that's the important part too. To do it is relative to the mouth size. But being able to just stop a conversation that lives in colorblindness, which is something that white folks will experience before I do. Right. The white asked me the question earlier of someone saying, well, someone saying they don't see color. People are more hesitant to say that to me, but amongst white folks, that I would, I'm going to venture to guess it's more of a common conversation. And so being able to name that and to do something about it is just saying that's inaccurate. That's right. That that right there. That and if that's all you have for that day, that's better than the silence that you had yesterday. That's right. I stop people too now, Danielle. I used to let people kind of, I used to let white people kind of get away with that, that you don't see color. What does that mean? When I walk into, I, I'd say uh, we had a conversation with some people at Rockford and I said, when I walk into a room, you mean you don't see me? You don't see me? Mm -hmm. What do you mean you don't see color? You don't see me? You don't see that I look different? Way to go, Kathy. What what are you saying to what are you saying? Yes, ma'am. Are you saying that I, I have no value? So I don't I if it's someone that is is willing to say that to me, then you're that's usually not a complete stranger or somebody that, that I'm not in this kind of conversation with. Because if you're gonna in, be in this conversation with me, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I'm gonna tell you the truth. That, that's, that is not okay to say to me that you don't see color. You see me when I walk in, I can, you see me when I walk in, when, especially when I used to walk into a store and I could see the, the uh, reaction on your face. Don't, you, can't, you can't say that to me anymore without some kind of conversation because we're gonna have conversation. What do you mean? You don't see color. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Maybe you need to learn to say some say that in a different way. Think about what what it is you're really trying to say and say it in a different way. Don't tell me you don't see color. You can't tell. You can't see. I think maybe we um, we white people use that as a defense mechanism or trying to say we're not racist or whatever. I mean. I've, we have lots of excuses for that, and it's good to be 
it's good to be told that's not appropriate. That's not true. Uh, that's very good. But what I wanted to say is at first I was thinking pretty much after your presentation that, you know, what are we supposed to do about this? It sounds like it's so bad. How are we going to make a difference? But the schools aren't going to get better until the people getting a job get more money for their what they what they're doing. I mean, maybe we have to be working for this $15 minimum wage, or maybe we have to be speaking out that things have to change in society if we're going to get the schools to be better, if we're going to get the kids in the schools to do better, if we're going to stop. And then another thing we should be speaking out about is this, this school to prison pipeline and the, mm -hmm. and the prisons that, may, that are set up for profit. I mean, how many people are incarcerated in this country compared to anywhere else in the world? Plus the way they live compared to the way they live in prison and other places. It's just, it's, there's so many things that need to change in order for the educational system to change. Find so one thing, find one, find one, just yep. take one of those things mm -hmm. and work on it. Yep. Don't think you can fix, we can't, you can't fix everything. Just mm -hmm. pick, pick one of it and give it your focus. And there's a direct through line to that. I mean, Susan, you named it. So we, the minimum wage issue, right? Those were directly impact families that have children that go to a school, right? Like that, that's, there goes that through line right there. And so we're shifting some social economic status and some needs, like just like <clears> that, <throat> you know, the, that, that right there, you don't have to be directly impact like with a kid, but there's a through line and find your through line. Danielle, could I ask you to say a little bit more about the fair funding fight that's going on right now in Pennsylvania? It seems to me that one small thing we could do as a group would be to support uh, whatever effort is being made to try to change that funding formula because the disparity is so great. I don't think it can be made up by people of goodwill who want to donate individually, but I think the, the, uh, the impact of state funding uh, has to be addressed. And it looks to me like um, people are trying to avoid having to deal with it in Harrisburg. Yeah. Um, I think they have the site PA fair funding formula because it's been, it's been going on, um, Lynn, for a while. Um, it, it's, the fair, it's the Pennsylvania fair funding formula and they have different ways in which you could advocate and participate um, in that process. Because it's now an advocacy group. It's been going on, I think, okay. since I, I think maybe my second or third year in, in education, if not, you know, longer. But it's it's continuing, and we cycle in different ones because we we went under Corbin. When we went under Corbin. A lot of things got cut, and so even but even in trying to rectify a system, it's so layered. It's so it's so layered. It's it's really going to take a, a, a strong groundswell to really make a difference that way. And I really like what Lynn said, because for the future of our country, I think children have to have equal education and it will never happen until we have a system that allows all schools to get funding at the same rate per, per student. That's my thoughts. Dr. Brown. Um, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. This was really helpful. A big aha for me tonight was um, the recognition that because Black teachers weren't allowed to teach in white schools after Brown versus Board of Education, we lost a whole professional class of Black professionals. And so working in education now, um, we're constantly talking about how do we increase the diversity of our faculty to match the students. You know, it, K through 12 is talking about this. Um, higher ed is talking about this. Um, do you, I mean, and it's a very complex problem, but do you have any thoughts about how, perhaps even through alternative kinds of certification pathways, we can encourage and bring, bring back that professional class? I know that, I mean, there's different programs that are coming out. I know that um, Pedro Rivera, um, our former Secretary of Ed, started a pipeline in Philadelphia um, where he started with a group of, um, I think it was juniors that were interested in education. Um, and 
and the, I think it, uh, the partnership with Temple University, and the reason why I know this is because I, I interviewed him for my dissertation, um, because he lives in this equity space, and I'm a big fan of Mr. Rivera. He actually is the president of um, Stevens, Stevens Tech now, but um, he spoke to creating that pipeline and putting programs in place um, for it, but you know, there's different things that are happening, um, but you know, they're being created in isolation. And so while you may address it in a pocket here, you know, to, to impact here, it, it's it's like our, our district, York City School District, we we're creating, um, we're, we're scouting job fairs and looking for schools um, that educate high numbers of, of teachers of color. And so we're looking to go to New York. There's, a, there's two schools in New York that we're looking in York City to go to to try to to you know, pick some some or get some teachers of color, um, Latino teachers specifically in that area, because that's where we're finding that there may be a high population. So there's different things that are happening um, in isolation to try to create it. Um, you know, part of these things that happen though, there's residue, right? And there's pain behind it and there's trauma behind it. And all of that needs to heal in our community as well. And that's the part that we want to make sure that happens. Because one of the things that, you know, we have to name also is that because of the complexities of issues in, in districts now, there's actually more funding that needs to happen there because that's what that's what equity is, is actually giving everyone what they need, not giving everyone the same. And so right. there's so many complexities that are happening because of just these generational spaces. I know Miss Jackson, I don't know if anyone knows Miss Jackson, um, she passed away, Miss, but she told a story. She was the first um, African-American teacher in um, Edward Hand Middle School in Lancaster, she had to attach a picture to her application. That, right? I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. She had to attach her picture to her application. Mm -hmm. That, I, yeah, so much, so much. You know what that program in Philly is called if I wanted to research it a little bit? I don't. Um, I could probably get back to you because he spoke to it and, and, and I could go back into my dissertation notes and see what he spoke to. I just um, No, you don't need to do that. About I, just, it. <laughs> I just thought if you knew it off the top of your head, <laughs> I can. I will search it out. But we, what we'll try and do is send out a, a mass email with some resources and links to follow up on some of this so that people can easily have access to it. Hannah, put that on our list, our to-do list. <laughs> Uh, to, 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 follow up, to follow up on that question, first, Dr. Brown, thank you for an excellent presentation and the educational data and statistics that you had were, were impressive. Um, it's interesting, I think about 13% of the US population is African American or black, and about 6% of the US population are black physicians. So black physicians are significantly underrepresented in the medical community. One of the challenges or one of the reasons that happens is that in order to gain acceptance to a medical school, you have to do fairly well on what's called your medical college aptitude test, your MCATs. And usually students of color do not do particularly well on their MCAT test. So one of the predominantly black schools, I'm not sure whether it's Morehouse or one of the other predominantly black schools, has decided to look at medical school applicants of color who have not done particularly well on their MCATs, but who have demonstrated other very positive qualities and traits. And so they're accepting some, some black students with low MCAT scores. And in then the four years of medical school, when you take your certifying test at the end of medical school, what are called your step one, two, and three, those students do as well or better than the national average. So they've mm -hmm. taken students who do not do well on the initial qualifying examinations. And after four years of education, they've done significantly better. And it's those so, kinds of stories that inspire me. And, and you bring up a great point and a contextual fact that I didn't even name, um, you know, the bias assessment practices within a school system. Like that is a whole nother layer and level of, of what um, we face as well. Like that, that it, it, yeah, it's, it's all through it. But that that's great. Well, Dr. Brown, it seems like it might be that time. Yes, thank you all. Well, thank you.
Thanks everybody for joining and uh, keep an eye out on your email uh, for the next session. I think we have a, maybe a small group session that we're gonna try and pull off coming up. Um, and then I think the next topic is gonna look at what happened at the Capitol. Uh, we can't go on without looking at that and understanding it and unpacking it. So uh, we will try and get dates out there for that. And thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks, thank Terry. you, Dr. Thank Brown. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.